My mother was an English teacher. And one of her favorite authors was Zora Neale Hurston, who wrote the book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Then the book begins, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men, and my mother would say, and of women. And the point was, two groups of people, those whose dreams are fulfilled, all of us, and then people who, for a lot of reasons, but particularly lack of education, never, never get the dream to be fulfilled. I would say what we do at UMBC, what I've worked on in my life is, how do we help people to dream about the possibilities and to fulfill their dreams? Dr. Bowski, when you first meet him, has this certain kind of confidence that's infectious. And he has a booming voice. And then also he has that personal touch and relationship. Dr. Hrabowski embodies the principles of inclusive excellence and high expectations at every level and at everything he does. I think what motivates Freeman to do what he does is his very basic belief in equity for all and that we need to live our values. We need to seek truth. We need to be there for our students. And he has lived that his entire life. My students are always asking me about my experience in Birmingham as a child going to jail to march for our civil rights. Now is the time hearing Dr. King, and, and I have to tell them I was not a courageous kid. I was a, a nerdy, fat little nerdy math kid, all right? The only thing I ever attacked was a math problem, all right? And so I always say to them, when they're thinking about doing something that's really seeming a little scary, that the courageous act doesn't come because somebody's so courageous, but because they have passion for the vision of what they're trying to do. From early years as a child of color growing up, my parents and my church and others said, you have to be twice as good because the world is not fair. Get over it. People with great privilege will continue to have great privilege. And if you're working class, low income or middle class, you may not get the advantage because you may not know the right people. And the only way you can be the best that's possible is to work really hard to be twice as good. Women have been told that, people of color have been told that, and I've always thought that way, and I say that to students of any background, regardless of race or gender, you want to be better than you thought you could be. Hi there. How's everybody? Good. Let me ask you all a question. Who's nervous today? Anybody nervous? Oh. When I say to people that UMBC at its young age, has educated more African Americans who've gone on to complete MD-PhDs than any university in the history of our country. People go, what? But what do you plan to be doing? What do you think? I want to be an immigration lawyer, oh. um, so mm -hmm. um, specifically to the Asian American community. Mm -hmm. The program that people continue to talk about is the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. Robert Meyerhoff is a philanthropist. 30 years ago, he said, if we give young blacks the same opportunities that my kids have had, he said. All things are possible. And he was absolutely right, we were delighted. We were trying to find people who would help us to show, to prove that minority students could be in a predominantly white setting and still excel in science. Particularly being an African American woman, I think the Meyerhoff program really allowed me to embrace being smart and made that the standard. I was part of a community and have been part of a community. I was actually the first Meyerhoff female to complete the MD-PhD program. Our passion together then helps to educate and foster the next generation, and that's really what Dr. Wabowski's kind of instilled in all of us. I've been working with the Meyerhoff students since the program began. At most institutions, people like me aren't used to seeing large numbers of high achieving minority students in positions of visibility. The Meyerhoff program has shown what we can expect from students who are historically been underrepresented in the sciences. 
Others now are replicating the Marhoff model. And we've now proven that it can be done at all types of institutions, including large publics. And the importance of that success is that it says to the scientific community that it can be done. I feel that UMBC is Freeman's body of work. And it is a beautiful university with a great culture of caring and support to all. This UCSF medal represents best in class. I don't take that for me personally so much. I take it as this is what we're working to be. We now have these young African Americans and people of all races on the faculties, of some of the best institutions in the country. It says what's possible at a middle class young university that's 60 years old, that you, can, you don't have to be rich to be the best. I mean, who could imagine a little black kid from Birmingham being in this position? It's, it's an amazing American story. Not about me, but about what this country can do when children get an education. And I can go on and on with these young people around the country who are on faculty positions, starting companies. And so there's this cadre of about a thousand of them now. And what makes them such examples of dreams fulfilled is not just that they are excelling individually, but they really believe of those to whom much is given, much is required. <laughs> we are in the house of God this morning to give him more around and praise. We want you to be on one accord with us this morning as we sing praises to his holy and divine name. Me and the brothers are here this morning to give him glory, give him honor in his house. Ready? Come on, brothers. Let everything that has breath praise him. Oh, he has to praise him. Lift up those hands and praise him. Bless his holy name. His holy name. I know you got it now. Come on, sing with us. Let everything. Let everything. 
Good morning, my brothers and sisters. It is good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we bow down before you in worship. Spirit of God, come and fill our cups to overflow as we worship you in spirit and in truth. You tend to our lives with such care and concern, and we pause to say, thank you, Lord. We give thanks, O oh God, for we adore you for your closeness and your nearness. Stay close to us during these days of uncertainty. Stay close to us, God, as we, we draw close to you as our loving Father, our Heavenly Father. Spirit of the living Lord, fall fresh on all of us, on each of us, as we worship you on this day of worship. Grant each of us, O oh God, an extra measure of faith to walk through the hurdles and the challenges of each day. Cleanse us, prune us, and take away anything, O oh God, that you discover in us that does not glorify your holy name. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Thank you, God, that we are the branches that are connected to you through Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, fill our hearts, invade our spaces, and we may know without a doubt that your enduring love surrounds us. Thank you, Lord. For those, God, today as we come to worship that are struggling with illnesses, Lord, we pray that you will reach your hand of mercy, that you will heal them. Lord Jesus, there are many who are struggling, not only in this city, but across our nation and our world with this pandemic virus. Lord, I pray that you would be their strength, that you would encourage their hearts, that you would heal their physical bodies to the ends, that we might be able to give you all the praise and the glory that is due to your name. Lord, we give thanks for this day of worship. Lead us and guide us. Speak to our hearts, O oh God, that we might hear a fresh word from you. In Jesus' name, let the people of God say together, Amen.
Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Uh, we have a, a few people in our congregation uh, that we need to pray for. Uh, let's pray for Sheila Smith's sister. Uh, her sister, Rutha Anderson, passed away in Clarksville, Tennessee. And uh, I believe that funeral is going to be this coming Tuesday. And so uh, Brother Robert and Sheila and the family, they're going to travel to Clarksville, Tennessee. So let's be sure to keep them lifted up in our prayers. Also, we want want to uh, pray once again for Nadine Todd. Uh, her son-in-law, uh, Frederick Moore, uh, passed away. And, uh, of course, that was the husband of Tanya Moore. So she uh, has lost a, a daughter and uh, a son. But let's be sure uh, to lift her and uh, their son, Frederick uh, Jr., up in prayer. <clears throat> also, uh, Reverend uh, Willie Lockett, Jr., uh, who's in a nursing home. He's in the COVID-19 unit. Uh, Longtime uh, members of this church, the Reverend Willie Lockett Jr. Uh, let's be sure to lift him and uh, his wife, Mrs. Lockett, uh, up in prayer. And also Aretha Manning's brother, Lester Stewart, in Ohio, uh, is sick as well. He has esophageal cancer, and we want to be sure uh, to lift him up in prayer. And uh, we want to pray uh, for uh, Yolanda uh, McMillan. She drove down to Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida on yesterday. Uh, she is taking supplies uh, to uh, our girls in Haiti. And we want to be sure to ask that God will grant her journey mercies as she travels there and travels safely back. back. My brothers and sisters, uh, I just want to thank you for your contributions, your tithes, in your offerings as you support uh, the ministry of Sixth Avenue. We are delighted uh, that we're still able to function uh, at a high level of ministry uh, because of your support. Now, should you need to contact anyone at the church office, again, uh, the numbers are 205-321-1136 or 205-321-1136. God bless you. As we continue on this day that the Lord has made, our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Romans, Romans the eighth chapter, verses one through 11. And the Bible says this, therefore, 
there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Oh, you can get your praise on right there, my brothers and sisters. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. In verse 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. My brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. <laughs>
down him. Yeah. Somebody put their hands together and give God some praise. I have tried. My brothers and sisters, uh, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to the New Testament, Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 26. Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, from the Word of God. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, Jesus said, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, Jesus said, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. He said, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Let the people of God say amen. My brothers and sisters, let's pray together. Eternal God, our Father, we're thankful, Lord, for this day of worship. We're thankful, Lord, that you have enabled us to gather together, in a sense, virtually to praise your name. And we ask now, Lord, that as we open the book, that you would help us to focus our hearts and minds on what you would have us to know and what you would have us to do. 
And even as Moses ascended on the mountain, Lord, and in humility, he took off his shoes and he bowed down before you. Likewise, Lord, right now in your presence, we bow down before you and we ask that you would speak to us in the name of Jesus. Let the church say amen. 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 Uh, the subject of our sharing this morning is entitled, Be Sure to Check Yourself. Be Sure to Check Yourself. In light of all of the things that are happening in this country and in the world, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, the protests against the unjust use of deadly force by police officers, the 11% unemployment rate that will likely continue to rise in the coming weeks, the political and ideological divide in our culture, the gun violence, Lord have mercy, on last weekend that took the lives of at least seven beautiful children. In light of all of the things, in all of these things, it is very important, it is imperative that we as believers, as people of faith, as followers of the Lord Jesus, approach these things from a biblical perspective. That's right. After all, the Bible is God's word. And John said that Jesus is the word of God that has come to us in the flesh. And so whatever the issue is, whatever it is you may be facing, I want you to understand that there will always be a biblical principle for us to follow. In other words, God always has a word for his people. God always has a word for his people. As a matter of fact, the psalmist says, Lord, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and it is a light unto my pathway throughout my life. All right. Now, now our text this morning is taken from a portion of what scholars call the Sermon on the Mount. And in the first verse of chapter five, it tells us that when Jesus saw the large crowds of people who had come from everywhere to see him, to hear him, and to be healed by him, it tells us that Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down. It tells us that his disciples went up there, they followed him up there, and when they reached him, it tells us that Jesus began to teach them about the kingdom of God. He said things to them like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize that they don't have it all together. He said, because the kingdom of God belongs to them. He said, blessed are those who mourn, those who grieve over the bad things that happen in this world because one day, he said, they will be comforted. He said, blessed are the meek, not the strong, not the rich, not the famous, he said, but blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle ones because the earth belongs to them and God is going to make sure that they inherit it. He said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. He said, he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what is good and right and just and pure because one day they're going to be filled with those things. And what Jesus was doing was he was describing characteristics in believers that are important to God. Now, they may not be important to man, to some men. They may not be important to some people in this world. But Jesus was saying, these are the characteristics that make you wealthy. They make you spiritually wealthy in the sight of God. And why is that? Well, because God himself is pure. huh? God himself hungers and thirsts for righteousness. God grieves over the condition of this world. Think about this. God is meek. He's gentle. God is merciful. God is a God of peace. And by the way, my brothers and sisters, you can see all of these characteristics in the life of the Lord Jesus himself. But then, then the Bible tells us that Jesus begins to teach them the true meaning of the Ten Commandments and the laws that God gave to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. And he teaches them, in our text, he teaches them that in order to obey the laws that God gave them, they must first be committed to do what God says 
on the inside. In other words, there must be a heart commitment, right? Uh, there must first be a resolve on the inside, not only in the heart, but in the mind to honor the Lord. Because listen, if you don't follow God from the heart, if you don't follow God inwardly, then it will eventually manifest itself outwardly, right? You know, it's kind of like people who go to work. Well, I'll put it this way. Some people who go to work or some people who go to the job because <clears throat> some people go to the job because they have to go or because they have been made to go, not because they want to go, right? And when a person doesn't want to do something, when a person is really not passionate about something, eventually you're going to see it in their performance and you're going to see it in their demeanor. <clears throat> when your attitude is not right, when you are not right on the inside, then everything that you do will be surrounded uh, by this cloud of, of indecisiveness, this cloud of not wanting to do what you have been called to do. Now, I don't know if it still happens today, but it used to be when your parents told you to do something, if you started pouting or rolling your eyes, or murmuring things under your breath like, you know, she's always telling me to do something. She never tells my brother to do anything. If you didn't first get popped in the mouth, you would be told you need to check your attitude or I will check it for you. Has anybody ever been told that? If you don't check your attitude, I will check it for you. Well, basically, now Jesus didn't say it with this, with that kind of attitude, but, but basically, this is what Jesus is saying in our text. He's saying, if you are serious about being faithful to God and his word, don't just do the bare minimum. Evaluate your attitude. Check your heart. Because if you are right on the inside, then your behavior will be a reflection of that. And you know, many of our parents knew that. That's why they said things like, you need to check your attitude. Now, in the Bible and throughout the Bible, the condition of a person's heart is very important to God. That's why Jesus said, for example, he said the most important law or the most important command is to love the Lord your God with all of your what? With all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. He said... The entire law can be summed up in these two commands. Again, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's inward. Love the Lord your God with all of your mind. Again, that's inner. Love the Lord your God with all of your soul and all of your strength. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. All of that is inward. It transpires first on the inside before it manifests itself outwardly. Now, in different places and on different occasions in the Old Testament, God said to his people, he said, to obey is better than sacrifice. And he said that because often his people would go through the process, they would go through the process of sacrificing animals as a substitute for doing what God told them to do. And the fact of the matter, and we might as well admit it, it is easier in some cases, for example, to go to a worship service and to listen to a sermon than it is to go to someone and admit that you were wrong, right? Sometimes it's easier to say amen and praise God than it is to ask someone for forgiveness. Sometimes it's easier to sing a hymn and, and get dressed up for church than it is to go through the hard business of giving or seeking justice for those who are marginalized. It's an age-old struggle. Men and women have struggled with this for a long time. But that's what God meant when he said to obey is better than sacrifice because sacrifices that require the bare minimum can be a way of not doing what the Lord really requires. But it is our obedience to God and his word that makes us most like him. I say again, it is our obedience to God 
and his word that makes us most like him. And you can't get around that. Huh? A person whose life has really been transformed is a person who has listened to and who has put into practice what God has commanded them. It's as simple as that. Now, our text this morning is about dealing with anger. Because anger, Jesus said, can lead to hatred, and hatred can lead to murder, which is a grievous violation of one of God's commands. And if you are not familiar with, you know, other passages of Scripture in the Bible that talk about anger, then I'm going to tell you, you just might miss the point of what Jesus is saying in our text. So now, in the context of Scripture... Jesus is not saying that you can or that you should not get angry about things. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, be angry, but do not sin. And Jesus himself, Jesus himself became angry a number of times, especially when he saw people being taken advantage of or when he saw a lack of compassion for those who had been afflicted in this life. Jesus, he got angry about those things. You know, there's also a scripture in the Bible and it's in uh, Psalm 7, where it says that God is angry with the wicked every day. So, so this text is not just about anger as an emotion, right? Look at the text. It says Jesus starts off by talking about God's command not to murder. As a matter of fact, he said in verse 21, he said, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. He says, now that's what, that's what you've been told about the religious leaders. He says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister, they will be subject to judgment. And he goes on to say, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is just like telling a person that he was utterly worthless, he says that person will be answerable to the court, that is a court of men who handle civil affairs. But he said, but anyone who says you fool, which in this context meant you godless, unforgivable, unredeemable person, anybody who says that will be in danger of the fire of hell. And so, and so Jesus was basically teaching his disciples that there is an anger that can escalate to murder if it is not checked, huh? And it begins in the heart. That kind of anger begins in the heart. You know, it was just so sad uh, to hear about what happened on July the 4th weekend when about seven children in this country were killed because of this now, this, this kind of unchecked, unrestrained, undealt with anger that was smoldering in the hearts of the people around them. And that's something unchecked, unrestrained, undealt with anger that has put the perpetrators of that crime, that has put, made them subject to the punishment of men, but it also has put them in danger, Jesus said, of the fires of hell. It puts you, that kind of anger, puts you in danger of being burned alive by the fire that cannot be quenched. That's a fact, Jesus said. There are, my brothers and sisters, there are so many issues out there today that can make us angry. But when your anger causes you to say degrading things about people, when your anger feeds into you the idea that people are worthless and that their lives don't mean anything to anyone, then you have moved away from God and you are, listen to me now, you are dabbling in the demonic. In the book of Genesis, before Cain killed Abel, God said to him in Genesis chapter 4, God said to Cain, he said, do not let your anger rule over you because if you do, Sin is crouching at the door, and it desires to have you. He said, but you can't, you must have dominion over it. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in John 8, chapter, verse 44, and he said this to those who would later crucify him. Jesus said to them, he said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want 
to carry out your father's desires. He said the devil was a murderer from the beginning. He didn't hold on to the truth. Why? He said because there is no truth in him. So in light of those scriptures, anyone who gets so angry that they deny the truth, and they just will not hear the truth. I'm here to tell you that that person is dabbling in the demonic. And Jesus said, when you dabble with that kind of anger, it puts you in danger of hell's fire. Now, Jesus says in this text, he says, there is a way. He gives us some solutions. He says, there is a way that you can help someone get out of this kind of situation, get out of this kind of anger early in the process, particularly if it is anger that is directed towards you. He said, he said in the scriptures, he said, if you are offering a gift to God in a moment of worship and it comes to your mind that a brother or a sister has something against you, he said, leave first, leave that gift at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother or your sister, meaning go and make amends with them. Go there and repair your relationship with them. Be, as a child of God, be responsible enough to protect both of you from that kind of anger. And then once you've done that, come back and offer your gift to God. Jesus, Jesus said, in other words, if God gives you the mindset then try to save people from this destructive kind of anger. And then Jesus went on to say, he said, if you can, if you can, try to settle matters with your adversary, the one who is against you. Try to settle matters with your adversary quickly before it goes to court and then money becomes involved and prison becomes involved in the process. In other words, Jesus is saying, I believe to us, his disciples, He's saying to his brothers and sisters, he's saying, somebody needs to make the first and second and third step towards reconciliation when you are brothers or sisters in the faith or in the community. Now, church family, I know, I know that there are some situations in this world that's going on right now that can make us angry. But it is imperative that we as believers as followers of the Lord Jesus, it is imperative that we do not allow our anger to have dominion over us. It is imperative that we do not allow anger to lead us into a space where we degrade people and we think of them as worthless. And so let me just say this to you, my brothers and sisters. Strive to do what is right, listen, in the sight of God. Not necessarily in the sight of men, but strive to do what is right in the sight of God, right? Seek after justice. Strive after peace. And always strive for ways to be reconciled with your fellow man and be reconciled to God. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians the 5th chapter, verse 18, it says that God... Through the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So my brothers and sisters, don't allow anger to control you. But instead, as sons and daughters of God, as followers of the Lord Jesus, you must exercise dominion over the anger. There are some things in this world that will make you angry, and they should, but never allow that anger to control how you treat other people. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we have to check ourselves. Amen. Amen. Doors of the church are open, and uh, we invite you to become a part of us. Uh, if you have joined us, uh, through the YouTube, Facebook channel, or even our website. Uh, we encourage you, you know, to become a member of this church. And, and if you want to become a member, uh, you can call the numbers that I gave out earlier, 205-321-1136 or 
1-1-3-7. And if you call us and you say, I want to be united with the church, uh, there will be a minister who will get back with you and we can make uh, that possible. Now, if by chance you have watched this broadcast and you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus, you've never asked him to come into your life, you've never recognized him as savior of the world, as king of this earth, as someone who is able to cleanse you and absolve you from your sins and free you from condemnation. If you have never done that, I want to encourage you right now to give your life to the Lord Jesus. He is the Lord of life. He is the Lord of peace. He is the Lord of the truth. I invite you now to give your life to him. You know, the Bible says, if anyone calls upon the name of the Lord, he will be saved. And so what I want to do right now is, if by chance there is someone who has never given his life to the Lord, I, I, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And so what I want you to do is repeat after me. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. You can continue to open your eyes. I shouldn't say bow, but we're going to go to God in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. I ask now, Lord, that you would come into my life. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And because of that, I will no longer be held uh, accountable and condemned because of those sins if I give my life to you. So, Lord, now I give my life to you. I ask you to come into my life. I ask that you would give me a new perspective on life. And I ask, Lord, that you would bring me into your kingdom and into your family. I ask this right now in Jesus' name, amen. Now, my brother or my sister, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to know that the next step is to be baptized. And then the next step after following that would be to join a church, preferably to join this church, since I have proclaimed the word of God to you, to join this church at, so that you might be surrounded by believers who will encourage you, so that you might know more of what God would have for your life, so that you can learn more about God's will, God's purpose, and God's word. I invite you to become a, a part of us. Uh, may God bless you. And now, my brothers and sisters, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for this day. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. We believe in your word, and we believe that if we're obedient to your word, we will be transformed and we will be made more like the Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to forgive. Help us, Lord, to be agents of reconciliation. Help us, Lord, to settle, settle matters quickly with those who may have something against us. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and deliver you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. Unto him be power, majesty, and dominion now henceforth and forever. The church say amen. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week.